I do think that we will have super human artificial intelligence, you know, I, I think probably within the next 10 to 15 years. On episode 62, I had Andy Bryan on to talk about AI. And the name of the episode was AI is not magic. And much of what Andy said on that episode, which was only recorded about three and a half months ago in February, is now maybe not true and definitely outdated. You see, AI, artificial intelligence, is developing at such a lightning pace that even after we recorded this not more than 72 hours ago, Andy said, by the time you publish this episode, much of what I said may be wrong. That is insane. And so in this episode, we're going to dive back into the conversation around artificial intelligence. And on this episode, we talk about the future of employment, education, data privacy, our own security, and much more. Much like on the first episode, I was left with a lot of awe. Andy Bryant is brilliant, and his ability to communicate fairly complex ideas into simple analogies, I felt was really helpful. So let's dive into AI. I'm Jarrett Carpenter, and this is More Than Blockchain. Andy Bryant, welcome to More Than Blockchain. How you doing? Hey, man, I'm doing great. How you doing? Glad to have you back. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. I'll tell you, man, three months ago feels like a decade ago. We, yeah, I was going to say, we often say in crypto, a week is like a month. Yeah. Sometimes it can be more depending upon the news and what's happened. And, yeah. you know, in crypto, there was Ter Terra Luna when that happened. It was in May of 2022. The, the coin price went from like $82 to fractions of a cent in about 72 hours. Oh my gosh. So horrible and it moves really quick. But now we're here back to talk about AI and you were on three months ago. Yeah. So if in crypto, if a week is a month or a week is like a year, what's it in AI? Because I feel like it's actually faster. Yeah. So at, at this point, you know, a lot of us, a lot of folks have been anticipating what this is going to look like when we get to this exponential phase. And it's absolute insanity. Like truly every single day, there's an announcement that would have been headline news last year. Right. And absolute earth shattering news 10 years ago. Right. And so just keeping tabs on all that, I mean, it, it's, it's impossible. Right. And a lot of really, you know, prominent researchers in the field are agreeing with that. They're saying like, there's, there's no way for me to know everything that's going on. Right. And so it's, uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, it feels a little bit like, you know, it's finally happening and, uh, I'm thrilled to be here and like actually experiencing it. Before we get into where you are now, because I know that you're actually working on some AI stuff for work professionally. And I feel like last time it was more, more of a personal hobby. I don't want to diminish it to that. Um, and I, but that's kind of maybe where the space was for you. Is that accurate? First of all, I've been working on it professionally for a few years. Okay. Um, studying it for about five, six formally. But uh, I'll tell you, man, you know, we're all so much more empowered, especially over the last couple of years and especially over the last couple of months that, uh, yeah, these tools are available for everybody. So I want to make sure they're available. Yeah, well, sorry. I, 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 for some reason in my head, it was that with the current work you're doing at the company you're at, you were just doing coding work as a programmer or maybe a software developer, but you were also doing AI. Can you actually talk about that? And also... As a caveat to that, it feels like maybe you now feel seen. Does that make sense? It truly, it, it truly does. I, I'm going to use this word in a in a in a way that I hope doesn't make me sound like sort of tech utopian, whatever. But like, it really does feel like the rapture. Like we are in this moment where like it's the first time that so much of what folks have been talking about for for decades um, is finally coming to fruition, right? And I think that, you know, the killer app that did that was ChatGPT. I mean, it was the first time in the public consciousness that it was like, hey, there's this thing that I'm interacting with directly as if it were a creature rather than like, oh, YouTube suggests me stuff, right? Like, oh, Facebook like knows my location. Like all of those can be under the umbrella term of AI. Okay. But, you know, here we are in a post uh, ChatGPT world where like, wait, AI is actually like this other thing that can take action in the world and like 
do things on its own, you know, on its own accord. Um, and it, it's just wild to be living in a world where we have those intelligent agents that are actually in the public consciousness as they are. So this is really good. And one of the reasons why I love doing this particular episode is because I'm a newbie with AI. I don't understand what's underneath the hood and that's why you're here. And that's amazing. And can you, because you've just said a couple of things. Because one, first of all, bad on me for thinking that you weren't working with it professionally. Oh, it's all good, yeah. But maybe you weren't working it professionally in the way I was defining AI. Because for me, the definition is like, oh, AI is ChatGPT. But you're saying, no, 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 AI has been around for a long time. Things like Siri and maybe other things that we actually engage with all the time, we just didn't think of them as AI. They just felt like tech, if that makes sense. Because I think as we move forward, and this happens in crypto a lot, the way we define things is uber important. Yeah. And the words that we use to define them, and on our first episode, and if you're listening to this, please go back and listen to the first episode where Andy was on and we were talking about AI. Definitions are very important. Like when we talk about linear growth versus exponential mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, this is X squared, right? Yeah. And we talked about S curves. And then also it's like something that looks more like a hockey stick. So can you actually walk back a little bit and talk about the stuff you've been working on AI for the past five to six years professionally, mm -hmm. what that looked like, and now where you are today? Because the story in my head is that you're able to now do things that you couldn't even do five or six years ago just because the snowball is going downhill, right? We're able to just do more. Like it, Moore's law, in some sense, is really coming into play, and it's actually beyond Moore's law at yeah. some point. Yeah. I, I started about six years ago at a machine learning research lab at Northeastern. And, you know, there's, I'll just step back and say, like, I think the term artificial intelligence is almost, it's not a misnomer, but it is, it is so widely used as a catch-all term that people say to kind of mean whatever it is that appears to be magical. Um, and so as a result, it's like the boogeyman. It's like the thing that just sort of like, it is, it becomes a projection of whatever we want it to be at the time. And from a classical perspective, you know, back, back in the 60s, 59, when it was like defined, you know, it's, it's basically when, when a machine can make a decision, whereas, you know, a human would have otherwise, as you're saying, encompasses like a huge number of things, right? Just like you said, it is Siri, it is YouTube recommendations, it is, you know, uh, classical machine learning when you're just looking at a data set and saying like, oh, what are the trends and how can I predict them in the future, right? You know, yeah, I think a lot of us have been, have been doing that for a while. I would venture to say that we are actually in the age of AI today. You know, the definition of intelligence or consciousness or sentience is like, I, I think that it's become absolutely, that, that conversation is really difficult to wade into. But from a very sort of like, let's just step back and be, be, be commonsensical about it. Like, I think, I think we do now have artificial intelligence in the world. And what's really interesting is that it's embodied. We do have the robots walking around. We do have the ChatGPT agents. We do have all these things. And that, I think, is like pushing the conversation forward so that like your grandma, your, your neighbor, you know, the, the woman who does your nails, whatever, like is talking about it. And that's when AI does take on that sort of like magical, you know, thing where it's like, uh, you know, something that everyone can use and everyone can benefit from. And because it's so mainstream and I'm using air quotes, does that allow you to feel seen? Like you're not just a guy working in an attic, like on crazy clocks or something, and no one knows what you're doing. It does because like that's how I feel. I got into crypto in 2017, and I'm going to reference crypto obviously because this is sure. blockchain. But AI is actually a bigger. It's becoming a really big part of crypto, and where those two come together is kind of interesting. But when I got into crypto in 2017, in 2018, when I have conversations with people, it was fairy dust. Then in 2021, when institutional money started coming in and other people started to see the value of it and it really gained some global adoption, I felt seen. Oh, yeah. People would finally come to me and ask me about crypto, not from a like, I want to hear from a conspiracy theorist, but from a like, I'm curious to know what he thinks about this because I know he's been around it. Yeah. And have you had the same experience with AI in the last, I mean, we're talking months, but like, you know, in the last set of time? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. The, the last six months have been like the most exciting. The last three months have been absolutely mind blowing. But to use your term, I, I definitely feel that way that, that there is a level of being seen here, you know, where a lot of it was like, hey, what can this like cool tech bro or, oh, this, this nerdy PhD student kind of do in their free time to like, whoa, wait a second. Like they are ap actually like changing how cities function, how governments are run, like how the economy works. Um, 
they have just like their stock has just gone up dramatically. Like if you're if you're graduating from Stanford with a PhD in artificial intelligence, like you you are you're you're good. You know, like <laughs> you just you just hit the jackpot because um, you earned it. But these these are the things that now it's 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 not just a bunch of nerds, as you said, sitting in the attic, kind of doing their thing. It's like we, you know, there's 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 a level of community there that's that's really exciting. Because I feel like, and I and I watched this movie recently. It's the movie with oh, who's the actor who did Steve Jobs? There, there's a couple of movies with Steve Jobs. Michael Fassbender. It's the other one with. Ashton Kutcher. Ashton, no, Ashton yeah, Kutcher? Yeah, it's yeah, Ashton yeah, Kutcher. Yeah, yeah. And he does a really good Steve Jobs because yeah. we kind of know Ashton Kutcher as a as a funny guy, comical. He does a yeah, lot of like, Yeah, I saw a couple scenes, yeah. Yeah, and then he takes on Steve Jobs. But the reason why I bring that up is at the beginning of that movie, Steve Jobs is mid-70s and he's just trying to get money and everyone thinks he's crazy. He's like, the computer's not going to work. Why would that work? And then in the end of the movie, he's a rock star. Everyone wants his opinion. Everyone wants to come to him to basically ask about what is the future? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And one of the things I've started to kind of say about more than blockchain is I feel like I'm a future documentarian. I'm documenting the future. Mm. And so that's why this conversation to me seems so relevant because the future is, you know, there's the future, the past, and the present, right? And the present really doesn't exist because once I've said this, it's already in the past. So really the closest we actually get to the future is living in the exact moment. And that feels to me from afar where I see AI right now. And just products like ChatGPT. Now, I still haven't gotten ChatGPT four. You just took it out on the kitchen table. We were looking at it. You were showing me what has ChatGPT four done that you may have said in the first episode, you know, in your first in your first time on the podcast, that is now changed. Like you said, hey, the sky is black, and it says no, the sky is white. Or what changed? And I and I have written down some things, but do you remember anything specifically from that first episode that you? thought, oh, it would take years. And here we are literally only three months later. And it's already like, wow, this is no longer reality. A couple things there. When we last spoke, we talked about how we would use ChatGPT or GPT-4 um, for like internet search, right? And I, if I'm remembering correctly, my answer was basically like, we would have to continually index, you know, these, these uh, archive, these pages and those sorts of things and like retrain it, right? And uptrain it, which is an option, but it would be pretty difficult to, to scale with that. And, and I think that that it was actually a, a decent answer given the architecture at the time. What I totally missed with that is that we wouldn't actually be interacting with ChatGPT for internet information. We would be interacting with ChatGPT to go and get the inter internet information for us, right? And so what a lot of people are talking about are these smart agents that are LLM based, but they're actually, they work more like a recursive self-calling decision maker right so you say like hey uh let's just call it the agent hey agent uh, i'm looking for the best restaurant in town well if you look under the hood uh, it'll say okay the, the the person has asked me for this information uh what are some ways that i could get this information oh you know what i could do is i could go to a website oh which website should i go to and you see that there's this sequence of events where it plans it out and it executes it in that sense the llm isn't just about generating text it's actually generating a, a, a plan and it's acting on that plan. There are then entry points to connect software to it so that it can look up restaurants on Google or it can uh, you know, use a calculator or a Python interpreter or, or those sorts of things. It's almost like a little Swiss army knife where it'll just pull out whichever one it wants, right? Um, that wasn't on my radar, you know? And so three months later, you know, I'm actually building this stuff for work and I'm looking at these agents that are you know, doing these self calls that to me is mind blowing, uh, especially in the sense that we can just do it. We can just spin it up. I mean, I, I put together a, an agent that was able to work with, you know, a, a dummy sandboxed API in like 90 minutes. Right. And so, you know, that to me is just like absolutely mind blowing that we're even having that conversation, but it wasn't on my radar. So here we are, you know, I think that's the thing with technology and information. You can only make the best decision standing there the day of as we're saying the closer you can get to the future which is really the present as you're talking yeah, yeah. and it's not that you were wrong there was just information that hadn't literally been revealed to us it's like seeing beyond the horizon of a of a what a, a black hole yeah for sure and, and the other thing there is that like when we talk about gpt it, it's changing every day right and so like unlike the iphone you know there is some it is fixed it's 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 less elastic but 
with with GPT, you know, it's a software push, and then it now has this capability, right? And so it's like you get this state of the world with these AI tools, and like as soon as you start presenting on them, you're wrong. It's absolute insanity. Like I was talking to a buddy the other day who I work with, and, and I was like, oh, yeah, these are some capabilities. These are some constraints, and, and this is what we kind of need to think about for our product. And literally like at the end of the day, I then read a research paper that had just been published that negated what I was saying, right? That to me is just like, it, it's so hard to even have a foot in the ground. Like you're just constantly swimming in this like ocean where there's currents pulling you in every direction. It's absolutely fascinating. That is when you know that you are on the edge yeah. of nascent technology, nascent anything, because it's just constantly changing before you can even uh, wrap your head around what's currently happening. Yeah, yeah. On the first episode we did, I, I, you said something that was really, I, I just loved it, and I, and I have the quote here. It said, technology is elastic, and you just used that word again, and I think it's, it's a good word. Technology is elastic, and humans are resilient. And you said this after I said, hey, should we be worried about ChatGPT, for example, taking jobs away from humans? This is one of the biggest fears that people have. Yep. And at the time, you said, you know, no, technology is elastic, and humans are resilient. Has that changed even in just three months, your opinion on that, now seeing what's happening and you telling me that, hey, I wake up at eight in the morning, I start working, and by 5 p.m., all the work I've done is useless because somebody else already figured it out or it's already been fixed. I definitely, when we last spoke, was like very concerned about job displacement. However, I also, I think I mentioned like, we're still going to have corner stores, right? Like there's, there's going to be structures in our society that like are actually physical or they're actually, you know, resilient to this, right? However, again, revisiting that three months later, I'm seeing that, for example, people are truly replacing not just the tasks that need to get done, but the sequence of tasks that need to get done. And we are right on the cusp of the decisions surrounding the sequence of tasks that need to get done. And then we're right on the cut, right? It just, it's going to continue growing to the point where, you know, I, I just read an article, um, it was called Replace Your CEO with AI, right? It's like, why, why plan? Like, why pay someone to like sit around and come up with ideas? Like, just tr like, hey, like, this is our business. This is what we're doing. Set it in motion, see what happens, right? Now, obviously, I'm not in a position to say like, oh, we're, we don't need CEOs or we don't need doctors or anything like that. But, but the trajectory is there that we, we really are empowering these agents to be able to take action in the world for the first time, like in a real sense. And what are the implications of that? My mind says it's very different than I thought three months ago. Can you talk about the sequences? Because I think that this is fascinating. And I was looking at this today when I was just thinking about creating content. Because one of the things that's happened for content creators is that, and you brought this up in the first episode, that basically the ability to create a content is coming down to a marginal cost of zero. Yep. There's no friction. Yep. I can just type in, write me a blog entry, 2000 words about why Bitcoin is better than stocks. Mm -hmm. It will happen in about 30 seconds. I can take then that, copy and paste it into another AI tool, and then you know refine it and say, now you have these 2000 words, break it down to 500 words and put it in bullet points, like whatever. Yep. So I was going through that thinking, huh, how can I start to create content at scale using AI? Could I start creating two episodes a week and one will just be AI? The answer is yes. And it's actually really easy to do. And I was looking into it. And the voice software now is super scary. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah. It's really scary. So I'm starting to think like, you know, okay, what are the steps to be able to replace myself and still have a podcast? Mm -hmm. Because the brand will just continue. Yeah. And it's kind of what you're saying about the CEO. So what are sequences, like, where are the, what are the jobs maybe? And I don't want, I'm like, I'm, I'm worried about you saying, hey, this job is going to be taken out, right? Yeah. If someone is listening, they're like, hey, that's my job. But at the same time, I almost think it's good for people to start to wrap their head around this. Yeah. Not to be scared, yeah. but just to be prepared. Mm -hmm. An example of this conversation is I saw someone at the gym the other day a guy we grew up together, and he does a lot of paralegal work. He works for attorneys, and he works in law offices. And he basically just you know, puts together PDFs at the end of the day and yep. makes sure that they're ready to go and gives them to the attorneys so the attorneys basically have their briefings. There's a lot of paperwork in our world yep. that is currently being done manually that I've seen AI that can like deal with that at a much higher level, faster, lower margin of error, and can do it 24 hours a day and doesn't need health insurance, right? So when you think about sequences in society, is there one particular thing that you 
maybe couldn't have foreseen. And to give a little bit more context of this, you and I are both millennials. And I think when we were younger coming up, it was like, yeah, you had to go to college, Mm -hmm. right? And the idea of a blue collar job that wasn't actually going to sustain us. And once again, I'm using air quotes economically. And it maybe was also something that was kind of like not looked great upon by society. You know, if someone was like, Hey, I'm going to go be a plumber and somebody else is like, Hey, I'm going to go be uh, I'm going to college. Well, at high school graduation, the people that were kind of more glorified was the someone who's going to college. Mm-hmm. They were seen as having more potential. But what I'm seeing now, longer term, is that many of the blue collar jobs, like no one's going to figure out how to come fix a toilet with AI. But for a lot of people that study liberal arts educations, mm-hmm. what you're adding to the conversation may diminish if you are part of a sequence that someone can just say, no, we're just going to boot that to the newest AI or the right. newest chat GPT plugins, which I'd like to get to. So thinking about uh, sequences, excuse me, is there something in particular that you think is just going to be totally transformed in the next 12 months? Search and synthesis are a couple words that I've been focusing on a lot. Jobs that primarily are about searching for information and then summarizing and synthesizing ideas based on it. You you mentioned paralegals, you know, so, so that's something where, you know, you watch you watch movies you, you talk to people you see lawyers talking into their voice recorder saying like to their assistant that it will eventually listen to it like pull me all the the case law that you know has some sort of precedent associated with real estate lines as it relates to fencing d- disputes in this residential area between 1960 and 1920 19, 1985 that's a day's work right going through the files searching for it you know that sort of thing within the next 6 months that'll be a 30 second task Right. And you'll be able to surface that information in a way. I mean, there's there's already there's already law, you know, legal products out there that are that are attempting to do this, you know, in a way that's safe. And so then it's like, oh, and then summarize it. Right. And then, oh, actually make a case for why this particular case should be supported or negated by these three cases versus the other ones. Right. So those sorts of jobs are very much going to be automated. Right. But I, I don't want to diminish the importance of the human in that loop to be able to be empowered by those tools, right? You know, when we talk about job displacement, you know, we think of voice actors, we think of, you know, a lot of the people who do their jobs remotely, you know, for, for some of these tasks. I, I don't want to diminish, you know, the importance of being able to transition into someone who is capable of using these tools to create that content yourself or, um, you know, facilitate that transaction yourself or or those sorts of things. So when it comes to job displacement, you know, what I'm thinking about, and I'm terrified of it as well, what I'm thinking about is how do I position myself to be empowered by these tools every single day rather than threatened by them? And I think that means someone who's going to be nimble. And I think that's going to be someone who's open-minded. And I think that's going to be someone who's on on the cutting edge of whatever the tools happen to be doing then, right? And so when when those three things are true, you become the lawyer, you become the doctor, you become the CEO because you have a hundred agents working for you as employees 24 hours a day and they don't need health insurance, right? How do we actually empower people with these tools rather than just say like, oh, your job's done. Now you need to be a plumber. Nimble and open-minded are like two things that I think as you get older are more difficult to maybe lean into. Absolutely. Right? The hardest thing in the world. Because, and also going back, you said searches, uh, what, what did you say? Search and synthesis. Yeah. Search and synthesis. Thank you. Yeah. When I, the way you describe that is basically my college experience. Mm. That was search and synthesis. Yeah. It was digest and put into your own words and then give it back. Right? Why did the Roman Empire fall? And how is that similar to the fall of Britain, right? Mm-hmm. Let's just compare these empires. Yep. And you have to read four books and synthesize in a 20-page paper. And that was your whole semester. Yep. And along the way, you were studying other things like different wars or you know, the United States as an empire, how we kind of have rose to power. I'm just thinking, and all of that, I could put that in ChatGPT now and probably get it out and it would be you know, fairly relevant sure. at some point. It would yeah. at least put me in a really good direction. And so- We've talked a little bit about employment, but just what you said about search and synthesis, education. Mm-hmm. You know, my sister just had a just had a child. He's seven months old now, six, seven months, I should know, seven months. And his father, from even before when well, you know, when I found out my sister was pregnant, his father was like, Yeah, um, we're gonna save up for college, but I'm pretty sure he's not gonna go. Mm. Because at that point, college will just be different because college for us was go to school, yeah, get a degree, leverage a degree. 
and your network that you had from college to get a job. Yeah. And thinking about everything I just said about liberal arts, where do you fall on that? What do you think? And I'm not asking you to be the ambassador of what's going to happen for education, but what are your feelings around that? As someone who's also been pretty close to academia in the last couple of years living in Boston. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'm not sure if you noticed uh, Khan Academy just announced Conmigo. Oh, wow. And it's um, basically, a you know, it's powered by, I think it's, I think it's OpenAI. And it is a little agent that sits in your browser as you're using Khan Academy. And it considers the context uh, that, that is on the web page. It considers the pages that you've been to before. It considers what you've struggled with before. And it's able to work through a problem with you, right? So it's like, oh, you know, what, what, is, what is, you know, X plus Y, whatever. And they'll put in 22. And it's like able to then break down sequentially, as I'm saying, how is it that a human could have arrived at this answer? And then it works backwards and says, you know what? I bet they forgot to carry the one, right? And so then it'll be like, it'll prod itself and be like, hey, you know, are you sure that you considered the exercise on page six? Or, hey, you know, it's not going to give you the answer. That sort of educational experience that, that it isn't tailored to you, it, it, it truly is you, right? It, 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 is, it is sitting in front of you as a one-to-one teacher. That sort of educational experience will absolutely transform, transform the world. I, I do think that we are going to be able to, to, to supplant a lot of what we think of as the sort of standard educational experiences, right? I wonder the same thing for my kids. You know, we're, we're looking at, you know, what schools and, and where to live and, and those sorts of things. I, I don't think it will be nearly as relevant 10 years from now to be in a, the best school district, you know, or, or to get into a good college. I, I think that's going to always be important to people on some level, especially folks that want to distinguish themselves from others. But end of the day, if you have a one-to-one tutor who knows everything about everything, including you, there's, there's nothing that, that you can't learn if you're interested. And on that point, on a personal level, I, I learn everything, usually starting with a chat TV conversation. It's definitely not right. It's definitely not true, but it's a great start to say like, hey, here are the top level things that people have said before. This is a great starting point. You know, Rome did this, but also America did that. Then go and figure out, again, it's about searching for it and it's about synthesizing it. And when I do that with an AI agent, I'm, I'm so much better off just as a 34-year-old person. <laughs> that was going to be my question. What is something that you're either currently using AI. We're talking a lot about ChatGPT here as well. And I think we're, I want to ask a little bit more about other AI products. What is something that you've used ChatGPT or AI to help you learn or that you want to use to learn? Yeah, for sure. So I do a lot of tech planning. Uh, I design a lot of, you know, systems, architectures that are going to be employed, uh, deployed, you know, in like an environment that users will, will have access to. And so much of my work there starts with, with an AI agent where I say, here are the constraints. Um, this is the technology that we're working with. This is how we've approached this problem in the past. This is what the end user experience is going to be, you know, as much context as possible. And then I will say, like, make things up. Like, I don't care if you're wrong. Just tell me how you would approach this, and it'll give me a spit out. And it's like, then, oh, no, you know, uh, that's not right. This aspect is correct. This one is wrong. And I'll truly iterate with this thing for hours. Like a lot of my day is spent chatting with AI about my life and my work. And I'll tell you, it has totally transformed the way that I do things from a fundamental level. And so I have many of those windows open where one is working on this tech plan or one is working on this Python problem or, you know, so I I have junior assistants working for me all the time, every day. Your company assumes that you work 40 hours a week. Like that's like the American office hour. Let's just live that you work. I think you may work more, maybe you work less. With the help of your agents, and I love that you just call them your junior agents, right? Your yep. junior associates that are part of the Andy Bryant working team. Yeah. How many hours do you think they add in horsepower? You know, a long time ago, if you had four horsepower, you were wealthy because it meant you had like four horses and a chariot, sure. right? And now- you can buy a Honda Civic for like, I don't know, something that many people in the United States can afford and lease and they'll have, I don't know, 100, 200 horse or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So how many hours, and I was going to ask like people if we broke it up into 40 hours, but how many extra hours 
a week do you feel like you now have? Like, what would that quantify look like if you had people actually working with you at home? Would that be 10 people working 40 hours a week? Like, what do you think just, and there's no right or wrong answer here. Two dimensions there. One is the quantity of the, of the, of the work. And two is the quality of the work. From a quantitative perspective, I'm estimating I'm, I'm, I have about a 30 to 40% increase in output. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching, you know, basically, you know, an extra half of, of what I used to do. On the qualitative side, I think that it's improved dramatically as well. My ability to iterate on an idea, to explore the different options that are available, to, to fail fast, to, you know, learn what else I need to think about, that has I, zero to 60. I mean, here I am sitting in my bedroom, like, like mapping out on a whiteboard, like, oh, like, what if this microservice speaks to this one? Or what if this server goes down? Or like, whatever. But like, I truly am now just collaborating with whatever documentation I would have read on my own. I'm collaborating with whatever service I'm, I'm, I'm purchasing that day or whatever, right? And so I do think that the speed of iteration isn't just about how much output I can have, but it's also about actually improving that output. And it, it, it has been a dramatic, dramatic increase in the last six weeks. Because what you're describing sounds like Jarvis, right? It sounds like Iron Man, where yep. he's like, figure out how long it would take me to get to Chicago if I was on a bike and moving it this fast. Maybe actually Tony Stark could actually do that in his head, but yep. he'd be like, and I'm carrying 500 pounds of something and there's drag and it's raining. How long would that take? And then Jarvis would tell him. And then he can be like, yeah, maybe I won't take that much weight. And then basically get to a decision point much quicker is that kind of is that you spend less of your day getting to dis, like you're faster to your to your decision points i'm not sure if i'm making sense 100 percent. I, I feel like i make more, many more decisions a day right and so what, what's interesting about a chat gpt in particular is you can you're watching the output come out word for word and and that's 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 not by design that that's actually a constraint of the system where it's generating each word you know programmatically i'm watching someone write the python code that I'm going to use. And so I'm truly like reviewing it line by line as I go. And I'll interrupt it and be like, oh, no, you, you made a mistake here. You know, oh, this isn't the approach that I was looking for. Like start where you left off, but remove that variable or whatever. And it just keeps going, right? So I'm just in this like constant like uh, chat thread with my work. And for the first time, I'm able to do that with natural language. And it's really transformative. When you're saying all this, I'm just thinking that, and I think I said this in the first episode that we have together on AI, it was kind of like the analogy was a calculator. Mm -hmm. You and I are the same intelligence. You take a test, you take the SAT without a calculator. I take it with the calculator. I'll probably get the test done quicker mm -hmm. and I may get closer, like closer to these decision points, to the answer, to the solution. And when I extrapolate that further, I'm thinking that those that even don't even have electricity, those that don't even have access to Wi-Fi globally are so far behind the ball now compared to you. Like a coder who doesn't have good electricity or even fast Wi-Fi now compared to you, where you're saying that you basically have 40% more of like a clone mm -hmm. to help you out, that becomes unfair. And thinking about the book, and I don't know if you read the book by Jared Diamond called uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it. Um, I've, I've listened to a lot of podcasts about it, but yeah. Yeah. The, the TLDR, the thesis is that those that had access to or, or engaged with each of those things at different times allowed certain civilizations to progress faster than others. Right. Right. If you got guns before other people had guns, well, guess what was going to happen? Yeah. If you had steel before other people had steel, guess what was going to happen? If we're talking about metallurgy and, and armor and stuff. If you, you know, when the Spanish showed up and the Europeans showed up, it wasn't the guns, it wasn't even the steel. It was, they had been exposed to certain germs and they brought over, I think it was like smallpox, for mm -hmm. example. And when I think about this, it's just kind of like that. It's like guns, germs, and steel and AI, mm -hmm. right? AI is now going to, figure into the equation as far as like who is going to continue to maybe figure out solutions to problems that's that humanity has and those leveraging ai they're probably going to do it faster is that is this resonating at all oh 100 percent, and I, I i totally agree with it at this point i'll, I'll give you an anecdote so I, I i work in boston i'm on the commuter rail a lot and i do a lot of a lot of work on the train and the other day I went through a tunnel and I was like trying to finish something and I lost my internet connection, which normally isn't a problem because I'm working locally. I can just run my script, whatever. But I didn't have the assistant helping me out make these decisions. 
And I had this little like panic attack, you know, it was like when the machine stops level, you know, of like, wait a minute, like what if this thing cuts out and it came back and, you know, I was, I was crying of course, and just shouting on the train. But the, (laughs) the, the, the bottom line is I totally agree with you. And even when I'm without it for a few minutes, I see my output go down. Right. And so if we still have people in public schools today who don't have Wi-Fi or, or we, we see people who have textbooks from the 80s, they might be a couple, you know, behind is such a charged word, right? It, that, that it's, it's not, we're not aligned on, on certain, you know, pieces of information or, 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 or how things might work. As we started this conversation with, if you're a week behind in crypto or in AI, you're a month behind. Well, what if you're a decade behind? You know, these are compounding effects here. And so that to me, again, is like one of my big things where if you're using these tools, you are advancing. And if you're not using these tools, you know, it, 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 it really has become an absolutely essential skill to have to be able to, to navigate this sort of ecosystem. The way you just described not having ChatGPT yeah. would be the way that I'm pretty sure anyone has ever used steroids. Would, yeah, totally. Would then be like, well, I used to hit the baseball 500 billion yards. Now I yeah. can only hit it 300 yards. Yeah. I can only hit it out of the park, not like into the next stratosphere. Yeah. You know, the, the doping scandal that happened in cycling beyond yeah. just Lance Armstrong. Yeah, you get addicted, not, not necessarily to the drug, but to the ability to that the it output. gives you. Yeah. To the output. Yeah. And wow, I've never even thought about the, the potentially addictive nature because it's like, what if, you, what if you know, your company's like, well, Andy's, Andy's performance has dropped off. Well, what's up with the guy? Is he yeah. okay? How's things at home? Yeah. Is he is he is he healthy? What's going on? No, he just hasn't had ChatGPT. It hasn't been working on his computer. Right. Wow. Like we will have that. Just the way now, where I work from home, if my internet goes down, I am. Oh yeah. I, I feel like I'm in the Stone Age because I'm so disconnected. And I live many months out of the year in Colombia, and there was a time where I was on a call, and the internet just died, and I didn't have cell phone service down there. Like I didn't have my like local carrier, so I was just cut off. I yeah. couldn't even put you know, put a text through them. Cause like here, if it cuts off, I'll go to my cell service mm-hmm. and then I'll hotspot. Or I can even just say, Hey, internet went down. Do you mind if I hop on with my phone? People are like, cool. Hop on with the video, whatever you're good. But when that happened, I was out for 15 minutes yeah. and I was actually leading that call. And I had never felt so just kind of lost. Yeah. Lost. Cause I, I had no way to even tell them. And I just had to sit there and be like, there's nothing I can do. Yeah. And, and I think that the, when, when you extrapolate from there, I, I think People tend to say, oh, well, that means that you aren't a productive individual because you are, it's just a crutch. Like your internet service is just a crutch, right? And it's like, well, no, like it, it is a tool that's essential for your work. Like, oh, if you don't have ChatGPT for a few minutes, for a few hours, then, then you don't know how to code. It's like, no, like it's just something that it accelerates your work and improves it. We've been coding, we've been synthesizing, you know, a text or whatever we're doing for, for, for many years. This just puts us over the edge for, uh, for, for, you know, actually our output. That's a really key thing that I think you just said, is that it's just going to enhance the knowledge that you Correct. have. Because I think about the movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper. Yep. And all that drug did was it enhanced the things that you already have. So if you're a pretty good writer, you're going to become one of the best writers. If you play the cello and you're decent in your local uh, parish or whatever, you know, play some instrument at the church, you now may be able to be in like a philharmonic orchestra or something like that. Mm-hmm. And hearing that, you saying, well, I know how to code. So in the middle of it, I'll tell Chachi, hey, hey, you know you're what? Not, yeah. You messed up. Yeah. You stumbled there and I know. So let's, let's, let's go back. And, or, or you're, doing, you're giving me an output that actually I'm not really looking for. Maybe it was on me. Let me tell you again. Yep. And one of the jobs that I've seen that's out there is, and you'll know the actual job title, but it's like, people prompters uh professional prompters prompt engineering yeah. prompt engineering can you talk about that a little bit every model that you interact with um has a different flavor it's the way that it's trained it's the data that they use it's the algorithm that they're actually using to search the model for what they're surfacing etc cetera, etc cetera. and as a result every time you ask a question of a different model it's going to give you a different answer even if it's the same question furthermore within the same model you are going to get a different answer when you ask it a hundred times the same question, right? And so you have, you know, you're, you're basically sampling from this distribution every single time you ask a question where there is going to be an optimal way to sample from that distribution such that you get the best answer that you, that you want or that you can. 
And it's your job to then know, hey, if I'm interacting with GPT today, or if I'm interacting with Claude today, or I'm interacting with Bard today, like, this is how I should approach it, right? And so the idea of a prompt engineer is someone who, you know, can come in and navigate this ecosystem that's available and say, like, hey, because we're looking for output X, we should actually use model Y, and we should use prompt Z in order to actually get it, right? In a way, you're coding, you're uh, writing, you're making videos with, with text, right? And your ability to ask it properly is really what your job is. I think the idea of a prompt engineer, I'm a little confused by the title. I do think that what I just described is actually a really hard skill. And I, I do spend like an hour to 90 minutes a day working on prompting, like specifically, oh yeah, like listening to podcasts, like it, it, it really is an art. But the idea of a prompt engineer to me, it, it just, it always felt a little bit thin. Like someone who is going to be working with these tools, like, okay, you're, you're an engineer, like you're working with these tools, you're, you're building stuff. But like, I, I don't know, it seems to me like a buzzword that's going to fade because you're just going to get better at a variety of tasks and prompting is one of them um, is kind of where I'm coming from. It really is, it really is a skill that, uh, that you're going to need moving forward. Yeah, because I've just seen screenshots on Twitter and on social media. And it's like, if you want to get a job with AI, mm -hmm. you can get, you can become a prompt engineer. And right. obviously like the ones that are being shown are the exception that like probably prove the rule, Yeah, but they're like $350,000 a year. Yeah. Because if you can, as you just said, be able to navigate between three different systems, understand how to basically talk to those systems. I mean, this sounds like C3PO stuff. Yeah. Right. You have an ability to speak a certain language in a way to get the system to behave. Is that kind of what's going on? hundred percent. And it, it, it basically you're aligning with its expectations and its training such that you're getting the best out of it. For example, there's uh, many research papers about this that, that I've read that find these artifacts in these models of what actually gets the best response from them. And there's actually a consistency with a lot of these large language models. Um, this was probably, probably four or five months ago now. But one trick is to say, think through this step by step, right? And they call it chain of thought prompting, right? Where you're basically, you know, it, telling this, the, the model to make a sequence of, you know, decisions about the text and then give it to you, right? Another one is, and this is going to sound strange, using the word let's. So let's work together on this. Let's think step, step by step. Let's do that. And it informs some sort of like collaborative nature between the prompter and the model. It's really wild. And this is actually something that's been mathematically proven with a lot of these models where, again, you're sampling from a distribution and it tends to favor those that include those sorts of words, right? That's a big flashpoint in the community right now because it's like, how? Why? You know, where did this come from? But here we are looking at these artifacts and saying, we're going to use them because it gives us the best, the best output. Using let's, that's so strange. Yep. And if you could see my face, people, I'm just like, this is a lot it's, to... It's wild. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot to digest. And, and this isn't nonsense research. This is, these are people at the top universities looking at this and basically saying, like, along these 10 key metrics, they are all improved by it, right? Let me give you another example. And this is fascinating to me. There's a, a really great researcher that I've been following, um, and he just uh, put out a paper about smart GPT. Smart GPT is basically, as I'm saying, a sequence of calls, right? So let's say GPT-4 is great along 10 metrics. It can do the GRE. Uh, it, it, it gets this score on the LSAT. You know, it does this, this, and this. There's a particular metric where it scores pretty poorly. It's like 25, 26%. And it's basically about reasoning, right? Like if I cut these, if I, if I have four balloons and I cut the strings, what's going to happen? It's talking about the physical world. Well, if you have three prompts, one of them is, hey, you are a junior associate at this research firm. Do three hypotheses about the question that I'm asking you and then give me three responses. And then you feed that into a second prompt, which is, hey, you're a manager at this firm. You're reviewing one of your employees' three responses. Give that person notes and why their, why their answer is wrong, and then you know, give them feedback as if you were you know, giving them boss. Get the, get the first person to revise it based on those notes, and then send it to a third person where, hey, you're the CEO. You have three answers in front of you. 
pick which one is the best. That when that comes out, so the user doesn't know this is happening, but it'll spit out at the end. That answer, and I, I promise you, it's revolutionary because it brought those metrics up approaching 80 to 90 percent. Right. And so he's in contact with OpenAI now. And the researchers at OpenAI are like, we didn't know this was possible. Right. And some YouTuber was just like, yeah, let's do it. And he, and he figured it out. Right. And so here we have GPT helping GPT, which is helping GPT. And it's this compounding sequential call that is just absolutely transforming things. Right. And so getting back to the point about prompt engineering, it's like, yes, we can be the prompt whisperers, but the models are going to be prompting themselves very soon. And we're going to still be humans in the loop, you know, doing these sorts of things. But the idea that we're going to have these one-off conversations with GPT, it, it, it's, it's very quickly coming to a close where we're actually going to be working with a network of agents and we're just going to see one output. But, you know, it's going to be networks of GPTs composed of networks of GPTs such that we get this response and it's absolutely perfect. This is uh, one of the times in the podcast where... I don't even know what to say <laughs> because uh, that's actually some Terminator shit. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and I think that gets back to the point of what we said where these models are shifting so much, right? So we were talking three months ago. GPT was a different piece of software three months ago, right? But we're entering into a phase shift where, again, we're no longer going to be working with one individual one. And so the idea that we, you know, uh, uh, think of a single, single malt whiskey, you know, think of uh, 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 milk that comes from one cow. You know, it's like it has its own flavor, it has its own vibe, it has its own thing. But like, we are going into this world where we're interacting with a whole network of these things. It's it's a homogenization process where at that point we're saying, oh, this is just milk, this is just whiskey because it's like twenty different flavors from twenty different regions and and all these sorts of things. So the idea of an individual model and the idea that we're going to be able to coax what we want out of it, I, I think is going to be, you know, going away. And the end user is going to be so much more empowered as a result. That's ridiculous because in the first episode, you said we were promised Terminator and got Siri. Yeah. <laughs> and now <laughs> three months. No, but, but that was in response to like, we finally got GPT. Okay. You, you know, okay. like, but like five years ago, it was like, wait, what the hell? Like, <laughs> this is all we got, you know? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So thinking about these layers, and I love the homogenization analogy that you made, because I think that that's going to be something really resonant with everyone. But with ChatGPT, they have Google plugins. Mm -hmm. How do those work? And is there one particularly that you're using daily that you find a lot of value in, in yeah. your work? Yeah, for sure. So, so you know, ChatGPT, that was the killer app. That was the iPhone. Uh, we just entered into the, uh, the, uh, the Apple Store. Uh, situation. I think we kind of talked about this a little bit where we're going to have apps that do it. How does it work underneath the hood? Again, it happens a lot with chain of thought prompting. And it is basically these LLMs, these large language models, calling themselves recursively in order to uh, uh, accomplish some goal that they've inferred from the prompter, right? At each step, there's a life cycle. So if you have 10 calls, there's going to be a life cycle that says at the beginning of this call and at the end of this call, do something or in the middle or, or whatever. And that is a layer that's actually rules based where it says, okay, we have up here, you know, above the ocean, we have these waves that are LLMs calling each other, but below the ocean, we have these rule based systems that says, Hey, I'm a calculator. Someone programmed me. Hey, I'm a Google search box. Someone programmed me. Hey, I'm a, a Grubhub plugin. Someone programmed me. And in those life cycles of these LLM calls, the LLM will say like, wait a second, I know what I can do. I, I need to add two plus two. Like, let me call the calculator plugin and check in on that. And it's like so much more complicated than that. But just the, 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 the general idea is that, again, you're using these LLMs to call each other and along the way, not just generate text for the user, but generate text for itself such that it can know what it needs to do to accomplish the user's request. Um, and so there's a huge ecosystem now of people building out these plugins and, you know, uh, making use of them. Let me give you an example. At my job, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that this is, it, is done live or, you know, anything. I'll just, I'll just say in general, it is possible to give one of these LLMs or these agents that we've been talking about um, access to your database, right? Which is which is insanity, in my opinion. And it's, never, it's not something that's even on my radar right now. But basically, if you think about it, 
we as humans interact with databases using text. You know, it's a structured query language, right? SQL. And that's something that we truly just type out. And it's like, hey, select this with these columns from these row, from these tables, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Why not have an LLM do that, right? And if the LLM can also prompt itself to determine what it should do next, at that point, you're like, hey, uh, you know, uh, Claude, hey, Bard, get me these rows from this database and transform them in this way, visualize them in this way, and then give me the result. It can 100% do that and take action in that way. And as a result, it just has so much power for these plugins to actually like do things in the world on your behalf. I'm going to try to make an analogy. Yeah. And you're going to correct me when I mess up. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So ChatGPT is kind of like a general contractor and the agents or the plugins are just like subcontractors. So maybe ChatGPT as the sub as the main contractor doesn't want to do the ele the electrical. So they're going to hire an electrician. And when I end up buying the house at the end as the user, I'm just buying it from ChatGPT. I'm not seeing that the electrical was put in by an electrician. The plumbing was done by a plumber. The architecture was done by an architect. I'm just getting out the house. And the house here is the analogy of the response or the solution to the problem I brought it. Is that kind of at all relevant? Does that oh, yeah. resonate? I, I, think that that's a great, I think it's a great analogy. Okay. Um, you know, something that I've done with these agents that are, that are call, call themselves sequentially is, you know, I basically program it in and say like, hey, whatever output you give me, run it through Python first. And so it's like, I don't care if you think it's right. I don't care if you've tested it yourself. Like, run it through a Python interpreter. Then read the output of that Python interpreter. Tell yourself what you did wrong. And then give me the output of that, right? And so at that point, like, I don't need to know what it got wrong. I don't need to know what it did. I just want good Python code. And it'll give it to me much better than if it was just this fluid large language model that next sequence, predict, next token prediction in that sort of like milieu correlation soup, it's actually running the code first and then telling me what it, what, if it worked or not. Can you give me an analogy for that, running the code first and then telling you, can you give me an analogy that I'll understand? Yeah, yeah. So like the general contractor, you know, that general contractor is going to be able to hire the electrician, right? And that electrician is going to do the work. But that general contractor is going to say like, hey, don't, don't tell me you're finished until the lights are on, right? That's what I thought, right? Yeah. Don't, I don't need to know that you forgot the wire and had to go back to I Home Depot. Care. I don't care that you were sick and missed a day. I just want to know that when I show up on Thursday, yep. I can turn the lights on. Right. Is that, go, what you're, that what you're saying? 100%. It goes <laughs> Cut back, through. Yeah, yeah. 100%. And it goes back to prompting where you give it a request. But what we've seen, again, proven, proven in air quotes, is that if you give it context, if you give it context a request, and a very clear definition of success. Those three things are kind of like the, the key elements that you, that you want in a prompt so that it can check its work and say like, oh, I haven't, I haven't actually filled the request because I haven't actually fit the definition for success. The prompting is huge. Absolutely. And I follow an account, and I hope maybe they'll check this out because I'll tag them in this, called Chat GPT Tricks. And they probably put up three or four, five videos a day. And they're reels, so they're like one to two minute kind of blips of stuff that's going on on Instagram. And they put up a lot of stuff where people are like, if you're trying to get a blog entry out for your small business and you run a bakery, don't be like, give me a 300 word blog about why you should cut down on eating this food. It's like, before you do that, ask me 20 questions about my bakery and everything you want to know. So that way, when you write the blog entry, it's better. And just stuff like that, like treating it I want to say like a human because it is, but it's like treating it like an omniscient human that can give you a, a blog entry of 300 words on why you shouldn't eat this food, but they could make it even better if they knew more about you is that it can be more contextual. hundred percent. So you're a, you're a great interviewer, right? I've studied a lot of interviewing as well. If you had a question, if you were interviewing someone and you knew that you had one question that you had to ask and it was difficult challenging would you get off the train walk in their house and say oh here's the question no you're gonna talk to them for 30 minutes you're gonna have a nice conversation you're gonna get to know their dog you're gonna you know the whole thing the same is true of ChatGPT, because you're gonna have to kind of prime the pump and say like 
hey, this is who I am. This is the conversation we're having. This is the sort of rapport that we have, right? It's very, very easy to think that it's alive. It's very easy to think that it's a creature. It's not. It's just a statistical representation of everything that it's read that you're interacting with. But the bottom line is that the more information it has about the exchange, the better it's going to be in answering that question. So what I tend to do is I'll give it an entire set of documents, right? And I'll say like, hey, here's three documents that I need for context. Ingest them, read them, do your best to understand them, and then tell me when you're ready so that I can ask you questions about them, right? And it'll do that. And then I will go and be the interviewer of it, given the corpus that I'm trying to inspect, right? And in that sense, like you said, you're sort of just giving it the context that it needs to be the person who's answering the question, rather than like, hey, I'm going to do a Google search here and just give you some keywords and see what you think. Yeah, because for me, as a user, that's what separates this from a Google search. 100%. You can get more contextualized and almost make it sound like your voice. And thank you for the interview comment. Oh, totally. I was speaking with some friends from college. We have a college chat. And I was like, hey, hopping out with Andy tonight. He's my AI guy. And what questions do you have for him? Like, you know, open-ended. And I'll re- I'm going to read you some quotes. And this is where we're going to shift the conversation away from ChatGPT to, I think, just AI in general. And Great. we may touch a little bit on some of the ethical quandaries, which I think we spoke about last time, where it's like, You know, last time you talked about AI defense, we may need defense Mm -hmm. to be able to make sure we're putting some guardrails here. And so I'm going to read the quotes almost verbatim. I've heard that using people's names with ChatGPT is a no-no because we don't know what what all it's going to do with the info. I'd be curious on his level of concern is around data and privacy. So data and privacy. I'm going to read you the second quote. You can take them as you will. Also, I think there's a world in which ChatGPT could totally be manipulated to create false information about a person or event if enough people fed it the wrong info. I think about the capacity for dictatorships to really weaponize it because it feeds us what we feed it. Yeah. So we have privacy and then we also have essentially misinformation on a level. And you spoke about this in in the first episode, episode 62, if people are listening and they want to go back and listen. But we have privacy and we have like security and ethical concerns and we're really getting into truth. Which outside of AI, we've as humans already kind of destroyed truth, at least in the United States and in many other countries in the world, people aren't really sure what to believe. Yep. So layering AI on top of that, and as you said in the first recording, now that we live in a world where it really takes no energy to create bullshit, where are we today, three months later? And when you think about data and privacy, and when you think about dictatorships yep. weaponizing this or anyone weaponizing this for their own nefarious political means. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we should be very happy that Stalin didn't have GPT-4. End of the story. We, we are better off as a species because Mao didn't have it because a lot of the, the killers, of course, I'm being like a Marocentric here, right? And perhaps there's other people in the world who, who are having a different conversation about different people. But the point is there. If we were to live in these sort of autocratic regimes that did control the narrative, their attempt to do so using those tools was effective. It's the equivalent of them having a knife and we have a submachine gun, right? You can generate the content so much more quickly. You can make it so much more effective. I mean, if you can use Conmigo to be the best tutor on the planet, you can also use, you know, these tools to be the best manipulator on the planet, right? And so I think that is a huge concern, you know, and so when Sam Altman and, you know, all the other folks go in front of Congress to say, you know, hey, you know, this is dangerous, we need to think about it. I'm glad that they were talking about elections and I'm glad they were talking about those sorts of securities because I I don't know what guardrails are in place. I I don't think we have many, but at the end of the day, we're all going to benefit from, from, you know, actually having some people be able to step in and say, this, this probably isn't a good idea. You brought up the submachine gun, yeah. and I love that, because in the first recording, you also said that. And in the first recording, you said something like, when we think about technology, and you were trying to basically, we were trying to compare apples and oranges, but you said the printing press is like a hammer, the internet was a power drill, and you said full-scale AI is a submachine smart bomb. Yep. Where are we today on the road of getting to the submachine smart bomb? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, 
you forgot to say that that the Andy is a broken record too. Just repeating the Andy is a broken record, but some things need to be, (laughs) some things need to be. You know, it's like in, and I've never been to London, but like the whole mind the gap, like that has to be there. So people literally gets in their skull because humans were we're silly beings, yeah. right? We forget yeah. all the time. We bump our heads on things that we know are there. Yeah, for so sure. So I think that these are really important things that you say. And hopefully people who are listening are like, when they think about AI and they're trying to have a conversation about it, because I do think that the amount of people that are in AI on the level you are is even less than the amount of people that are in crypto. Mm-hmm. And that worldwide is three or 4% that own it. And the people that are really daily working in it, studying in it, having a podcast about it, having a lot of real world relationships that they've made around the people around the globe, it's we're, you know, it's a small percent. So the story in my head is it's good that you're repeating these things. Right. And it's also good that even as the technology changes, there are some things that I think people will be able to agree upon. Yeah. That if this is, if we're thinking about technology and the printing press is only a hammer and you're saying this is going to get to a submachine gun, then that's something we really need to lean in to understand more. I do think that that's happening. And, and unfortunately, I do think that the power is primarily going to be in the people that have the most money, right? I mean, we, we've seen that with this technology. I think that when it comes to labor, it's going to favor the people with capital over those who are doing the tasks, right? But at, at the end of the day, I do think that there's going to be a regulatory force. And I'm not talking about the government. I, I mean to talk about open source where we have Google, we have OpenAI and Microsoft who are closely collaborating. We have you know, Baidu, we have Yandex. We have so many of these companies who are building these large language models and, and deploying them. Having a robust open source community that is doing this on their own with self-funding and you know, building a large language model for their library, building a large language model for their country, building it, you know, it, the UK just announced that they were building a foundation model and they were, you know, devoting millions of pounds to it, right? So that they would have one, right? Italy's going to have one. China's going to have many, you know, those sorts of things. That can meet, that to me is a sort of like regula- regulatory force in the world to prevent the autocrats from having all of the power so that we can get these regimes, you know, we can get these different ideologies, you know, in front of these regimes and empower the people there. Unfortunately. We still have a lot of the same societal barriers, right? In in North Korea, they're not going to have access to the ones that are actually, you know, pursuing truth, right? To a certain extent, we we might not get that in the United States on in some institutions, right? And so we're always going to have that problem. But I I'm bolstered by the possibility that the open source community, where people aren't necessarily trying to make money, but they're just trying to make something good, uh, are going to kind of empower us all. I'm going to talk about Bitcoin here, but. I think it's, I'm going to try, to try to try to wrap it back to AI here. One of the reasons why people who are Bitcoin maxis, we spoke about this, you, you'd never yeah, heard that the maximalists, right. one of the things that they talk about Bitcoin being is that we, we get into a human nature discussion that humans left to our own devices, well, eventually it's going to look like the Lord of the Flies, right? And eventually there's power and there's ego and there's resource hoarding and then there's war. Mm-hmm. And there's only a finite amount of earth on the planet. There's only a finite amount of certain resources. And if we keep growing, you know, it's human nature. So one of the things that Bitcoin maxis will talk about is the brilliance behind Bitcoin, because no one really owns it. It is a true decentralized network that is built and moves forward on consensus. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's the one thing that should, out of all crypto, kind of make it to the end. Mm -hmm. Everything else, you know, the idea is that if it has a CEO, it, it could go down. Right. Elon is the head of Tesla. If Elon were to have a heart attack tomorrow, Tesla stock would plunge because without him pushing it forward, it kind of changes. Most big things in human history have one central figure. Steve Jobs, Apple. Religions have their one central figure. There's not really something that's really blown up without one person probably pushing it forward. You think Amazon, most people know who Jeff Bezos is. And Bitcoin is created by a pseudonymous person. It could be multiple people. But from my opinion, is that this person or people, they've walked away from it. They have a lot of Bitcoin. I think it's $30 billion right now, just sitting in a wallet. And I think they probably burn their seed phrase. So they can't even get access to it, meaning that they can't ever even prove who they are on some point. So it's this huge entity that's a global monstrosity that no one really 
you know, it's pseudonymous. So it's driven by no one. We don't know who Satoshi is. And when I think about that, and then I think about AI, and you said this in, in the first recording, was that like, maybe Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't be the best person to be running the big AI or yeah. like the biggest LLM that we would have. Thinking about Bitcoin maybe being that perfect decentralized thing that no one really owns, everyone owns, but no one's really the leader of. You outlined someone, uh, De- uh, Hassabis. Demis Hassabis, yeah. Demis Hassabis in the last episode. It's probably not going to happen like that because as you're saying, it needs a lot of resources and you're going to have to, it, it's going to be resource intensive to get an AI language learning model, a large language model off the ground. I guess what I'm trying to get to is, is there a situation in the future where a state, potentially the United States, has access to everything and can, through the internet, and can just run everything and distort the truth to whatever it wants to using AI as its spearhead? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's hard to say what, how things would work once we get past a certain threshold of intelligence. Um, I do think that we will have super human artificial intelligence, you know, I, I think probably within the next 10 to 15 years, um, you know, within the next five, I think that we're going to have something that appears very similar to a human on many different metrics. And if that's true, then, you know, we're, we're headed to a place that I, I think increasingly we're going to be threatened by people wielding that in a way that harms other folks, right? It's funny, to, funny that you bring up Facebook because, or, or Mark Zuckerberg, I had never thought I would say this. Meta research in the last 30 days, 60 days, has done more for the open source community than any other institution on the planet. And that's wild to me. The biggest cost in this whole thing is training the model, right? Now, the way that many of these large language models work is that you're training the foundation model and then you're refining it through something called re- reinforcement learning with human feedback where you're basically getting many prompts and then having humans review them what meta did is they built a large language model trained it you know it's a huge huge thing not as big as you know um gpt or, or you know some of the other gpt4 or some of the other bigger ones but they released the weights they call them so basically the file to the research community and said like, hey, go ahead and use this, see what you can do with it, let us know how it works. Well, within 24 hours, those weights were leaked, right? They were put on BitTorrent, right? And, you know, they were, you know, they had access to them. And so I don't know if you've heard, you know, these different names get thrown around, but this was the Llama model, you know, LLM Llama model from Facebook. We've had this lineage of models that are based on top of it called the alpaca, called the vicuna, called the, you know, those sorts of things. And it's this whole family, right? And these models are wildly capable, right? And, you know, they're training these things, you know, with a nonsensical kind of bad computer to, to become something better because Facebook gave them, you know, the power there. I wonder if we're going to continue on that trajectory. I, I do think that the open source community is benefiting from being in the golden age of AI right now because people are like, oh, this is so cool. This is so new. Let's just kind of contribute to research. But as we've seen in the last you know, 90 days in particular, Google now realizes that the open source research that it's been doing for the last you know, however many years is actually a existential threat to them. And so the last round of research papers that has come out, if you read them by Google, they are so close-fisted. They are so wildly opaque because they're not saying how they're training their models anymore. Sorry, I'm speaking very generally, but some of the ones that I've read you know, have not talked about the data sources. They've not talked about the architecture. They've not talked about these sorts of things. Whereas five years ago, they released a paper about transformers, and that is literally in the name of GPT, right? So Google invented the technology that truly is in every single, pretty much every large language model on the planet, right? And so what we're seeing, I think, is the beginning of what an open source kind of winter becomes, right? You're not going to spend $50 million to train a model and then give it to the internet. Like, it's just not an economically viable option. However, we are still in that echo of, you know, the late, you know, 20 teens and the early 2020s where we're uh, we're, we're getting the benefits of that stuff, but it's going to dry up, right? And so I'm concerned that we aren't going to have those regulatory forces to kind of push back against, because just like you said, it's, it's getting cheaper, 
but it's never going to be wildly cheap to train a major model. Uh, sorry, never is obviously the wrong word, but like it, it is it is wildly unfathomable that we would get a GPT-4 or a BARD level model by an open source community that just, you know, is doing it in their free time. Yeah. And that's really where I wanted to get to, because I think once again, I'm going to use crypto as the analogy, but that's why I think Bitcoin will last forever because it doesn't have a CEO. There's no one that you can go to. There's no company you can go to. If the United States decides to basically regulate crypto into, into, you know, into the Stone Age and they take out Ethereum, which is the second biggest market cap, and they say you can't have Ethereum in the United States, then mm -hmm. you can't because the company will have to apply, you know, comply with that. Now, individual citizens could still own Ethereum in their wallets, but, the, but you wouldn't be able to get it. it for, if you went on to Coinbase, for example, you wouldn't actually be able to buy it because Coinbase then wouldn't have it because it's, a, it's something that is no longer allowed in the U.S. Right. But Bitcoin is outside of that. And Got you it. can run your own nodes. It's a completely different network. So I was asking to myself, is there a situation where there could be a large language model that is run essentially by itself or by the open source community? I think you've come to it, which is the open source community. But you're also saying that it's going to be very hard for the open source community long term to create something that would compete with a private company strictly just due to resources. Yeah, I, I think so. And and the cost, you know, the cost of doing so is is dropping. NVIDIA is is coming out with some graphics cards that that truly are going to be revolutionary. And like people are anticipating this as a like a, a watershed moment because of the ability to train large language models. The analogy that that is in my head, we for the last few years, even the last six months, we have been in the beginning days of streaming when Netflix was cool. For AI. For AI. When did that happen? I feel like that's like 2013, 2012? For, 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 for AI? For Netflix. For, for, uh, because it's funny, 2012 and 2013 were actually like the moments that, that this technology and AI like, okay, came, came to be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Netflix was, yeah, I, I mean, I was watching it in like 2009 was like the first time it's I streaming. was streaming, streaming, but like we are in that moment now. And think about the way that streaming works today. It costs more than cable. You have Disney Plus, you have Netflix, you have HBO. Like everyone is now doing the sort of economic edging out where they say, I'm the competitor in this space. I'm going to be the best in this space. That is the next chapter of artificial intelligence where we had the open source community, which was rah, rah, rah. We're all doing this together and it's great. We're all empowered. But the, the big boys, the Googles and the Baidus and, you know, are saying like, wait a second, like we have all the data. We have all of, you know, many of the researchers, we can, we can edge people out like crazy. We are very quickly going to get to the point where they put up their walls and say, we're not sharing any of our research. We're not sharing, sharing any of our data. And we're going to go back to the equivalent of cable, which was $80 a month, which was $100 a month. And it's just now streaming and and everyone has ads now too it's crazy so like we see that the market you know capitalization of this space is happening already in the same way that streaming did over the last decade this i mean this conversation just it evolves at a pace that is scary yeah only scary because i think it's hard to comprehend yeah it's like when you listen to neil degrasse tyson talk about the universe that's how i feel about ai because i constantly hear things that they're, as you've said, they're exponential and not linear, and we are linear beings, and that's how we think. And this is kind of like bending time in yep. what you're talking about. So one, one thing, though, if you don't mind, uh, I want to address your, your other friend's question about uh, data, about privacy. Don't put anything sensitive in these chatbots. Into ChatGPT. 100%. Yeah. Uh, it's not a coincidence that uh, the day after GDPR, the European Union, said, hey, uh, we can find sensitive information in the models if we look hard enough. It's not a coincidence that the next day, OpenAI announced that they will not be retaining any more data for training. This was a huge announcement. I think it was March 9th, right? This is an existential threat to large language models, anyone who is, who is economically tied to them. Because if the European Union, and this is like a gross reduction of what GDPR actually is, a huge cornerstone of it is the right to be deleted, the right to be forgotten, right? If you're storing my data, I can have a legal, have a court that's enforced actually go and say, this company has to delete it, right? You can't do that with a large language model, right? The data that it was used to train, it's not like you're going to go in and like snip out one person's name and like make it work properly, right? 
it's it's this huge vast sea of correlation that is connected through tokens in a way that is absolutely mind-bogglingly complex, right? And so everyone and their brother who has a large language model is sitting on personal information from people around the world and they're just waiting for someone to call them out on it. I think that this is an existential threat. I think this seriously is a ticking time bomb. But we don't have regulation surrounding it. So let's hedge our bets and do not share anything personal with GPT. Now, I do every day in ways that it's just like, like we just did, like, hey, I'm looking for a restaurant. I live in Salem, Massachusetts, you know, whatever. I don't think that that is like something that's going to come out and bite me. But if I was like, hey, I'm having these negative thoughts or like, hey, I'm planning on doing this. And my friend just asked me if I could, you know, buy him. You know, it's like, don't you really shouldn't be sharing this sort of stuff with the model because you never know how it's going to be used. Yeah, because now you're almost getting to a level of like minority report. Oh, 100%. Where it's like, hey, I was talking to ChatGPT the other day or by like, what, what's that? Google Home, whatever they are. Those have been said to, you know, listen to what you're saying, whatever. It gets into a large language model. And they start to say, well, we can predict that the people who say these things and do these things and are asking these things are more likely to commit crime. That is literally the oh, yeah. premise of Minority Port with Tom Cruise. Oh, yeah. And, and, and just to, to, to take it one step further, I won't say the name of the company, but I was just interacting with an employee of a large company you know, in Boston. It's actually international. But they got a company-wide memo that said, don't, don't even use it at work. Don't even use these large language models at work. And the, the extrapolation that I did was like, wait a second, if they knew that these employees of this company were using this language model and they were able to track which ones were saying what and when, they could draw inferences about the, what was happening at that company. They could draw inferences about the people at that company. They could do that. And then, and then in ways that they wouldn't even understand, I'm not saying that this would be some nefarious act by you know, Google or, or whomever. In ways that they couldn't even understand, they would be training the next model to reflect the conversations that those employees at that company were having. If Coca-Cola, if, if Disney, if these people, if they had the Disney employee conversations available and they were in some sort of like tranche of data that, that became, you know, sort of a part of the data set, that's something that could truly perpetuate to GPT-5 and then be in the base model of GPT-6 and then be in GPT-7, so that the Disney employee conversations, which were more racist than the other ones, or these that were more whatever than the other ones, could actually be reflected in the brand when people talk about Disney for the next decade, right? And so we have this representation of these conversations in a way that truly, again, when we ask these questions of these models, we don't know how they're getting the answers to us. We, we have a general idea, but we don't know how they're using the data. And as a result, they could be making inferences about the people that they're having conversations with. And as a result, you 100% should not be interacting with these things in a way that someone could later draw inferences about you in particular. Wow. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I just wanted to anyway, address uh, your, your friend's question. No, that was good. I, I think that's the mic drop. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the episode just cuts and then it's just like there's an awkward DJ scratch. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I would love, please, please, please bring me back. Three months from now, the world is going to be a wildly different place. And then I'll say, nope, I was wrong again, you know? <laughs> you know, we, when I originally said it, and I've been trying to get people to come on after three months, you know, if they're into NFTs or if they're into a different part of tech, because it is all moving very, very quickly right now. But I definitely think if you're down, I mean, every three months, uh, I think we're also have a really good catalog. If we do this for a couple of years to look back and be like, oh my God, let's we'll be able to take the audio and drop it in and be like, Tell us the common threads of each one. You know, TLDR, give me 10 points from the first yeah. episode, the second episode. And we're just going to be like, uh, it's going to be amazing. This conversation is being listened to by GPT-5 in the future. It is. True story. It is. So let's do it, man. Absolutely. Well, Andy, I'll put the links. I'll put your LinkedIn link in the oh. chat. And uh, thanks so much for hopping on. Thanks, man. Thanks for checking out this episode of More Than Blockchain. And if you'd like to get in touch with Andy, I'm going to go ahead and leave his LinkedIn info in the show notes. As always, please subscribe to the pod wherever you're listening to it. And if you gain value from this, please go ahead and share the link with a friend, family member, or colleague. The reality of it is AI is probably going to affect all of us in the next five years. So learning about it now is quite, in my opinion, invaluable. 
Be sure to follow us on social media at More Than Blockchain. And thanks for checking out this episode of More Than Blockchain. I'll see you next time.